When I was a kid, like many of you, I used to watch just a lot of the different Saturday morning uh, programs on, on TV, the kids' programs like, oh, Sesame Street, Electric Company. Anybody remember those shows? Romper Room. I was actually on Romper Room. My mom tells me. I don't remember it, but they had regional different tapings, and she thought it would be good to give me my five minutes of fame or whatever. I don't remember, but she said that at one point during the taping, I was the only kid on the show that had to use the bathroom and said, hey, I got to leave. And so I ran off stage or something like that. But anyway, Romper Room, uh, Mr. Rogers, those types of, of things. Mickey Mouse Club. Did anybody watch that when they were a kid? I remember that. Um, and uh, by the way, speaking of my younger days, for those of you that are... Uh, younger here today, this template that I'm using for the message, that's what we call a chalkboard. That's what they used to use in schools. I can remember having to go outside and clap the erasers together uh, after class. That was a, a fun thing. Um, but anyway, one of the, the hottest shows when I was a kid was the Mickey Mouse uh, Club. And I don't know if you heard about the kid uh, that uh, said he wanted a Mickey Mouse outfit for Halloween to dress up in for for Halloween, and he just had his heart set on that, and his, his, his dad kept saying, no, you can't have one. He said, no, I really want a Mickey Mouse outfit. Finally, his dad said, son, I'm very sorry, but I cannot buy you a Mickey Mouse outfit because the Denver Broncos are not for sale. But anyway, um, I know, I, I couldn't resist. Well, you know, the strange thing is, have you ever known adults who, who even though they're 30, 40 years old, can still be found laughing through old reruns of those classics like uh, Dick Van Dyke or um, Andy Griffith's show. We love to watch those. And I mean, I've seen probably every episode, but even if I've seen it before, I just find myself laughing uh, through it. It's, it's kind of like the, the Frosted Mini Wheats commercials. I'm an adult, but the kid in me uh, won't uh, die. Um, they're Toys R Us kids. You ever known uh, adults like that? that they, you know, they, they just don't want to grow up? Well, when a child acts like a child, pretty normal. We expect it, right? Uh, in fact, you know, uh, it can be kind of funny and cute as we watch little Zoe, you know, just started walking a few weeks ago and just, just watching a child grow up. Um, it's just amazing, and especially the different perspective. You know, we have six kids, but now as a grandparent, that's a little different. You're wiser, you're older, hopefully wiser and older, and just see life through a little bit different lens. But when an adult acts like a kid, well, now we've got a problem. Um, it can be a little bit awkward when adults don't act like adults. I want to take you back again to 2,000 years ago, the first century, this uh, Jewish believing audience, this group of Christians who had come out of Judaism, been saved, probably many of them early on after the crucifixion when the church was in its earlier days. And we're going to take a look at some adult Christians who were acting like baby Christians. And to introduce this passage, if you want to be turning there, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 5. I want to show you a cute little experiment a video showing a, a little experiment that was done by a large church out in, in the Dallas area. And it shows kids being kids, kids doing what kids do. It illustrates how hard it is for kids sometimes to do what's right, to exercise patience, to choose the better between two options, to make wise choices or to delay gratification. All of these things should sound familiar because it's what we as adults should be trying to do every day. As we grow mature in our faith, grow in Christ's likeness, become more knowledgeable about God's Word, we ought to be able to exercise patience, make the better of two choices, learn how to have wisdom. So the spiritual implications of this little illustration are far-reaching, but it, it begs the question, are adults any different? So here's how it works. Let me kind of set the stage. Um, basically, they bring these young, young children in one at a time to this room, and they say to them, look, I'm going to give you this marshmallow. It's called the marshmallow test. Now, you can have this marshmallow if you'd like it, or if you'll wait, when I come back in, I'm going to give you a second marshmallow, and you can have two. But if you eat this first one, that's all you get. So it's up to you. And it's, it's really quite, uh, quite cute. 
Sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Oh, it smells really good. Have it now, or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. So I'm going to leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. <laughs> How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. <laughs> oh boy, that one girl, she didn't have to think about it at all. She just said, forget it, I'll just take the one. Well, one of the hallmarks of, of spiritual maturity is the ability to exercise patience, to choose the better between two options, to have wisdom, to make wise choices, to delay gratification. As we've been discussing, the original readers of the book of Hebrews were in a situation where they needed wisdom more than ever. They were faced with a tough decision. They could either continue following Christ, continue assembling themselves together, continue associating with fellow believers of their day, and possibly face some pretty tough persecution if they did so. Or, in a moment of weakness, they could cast it all aside, revert back to Judaism, which was still under sort of Roman protection at the time, and abandon the Christian faith. So again, we're going through this series on the book of Hebrews, verse by verse. The time frame was the late 60s AD is when the, the author wrote this letter. We don't know exactly who wrote it. Uh, we could speculate it was probably Paul, but we can't say with certainty a lot of similarities to the Pauline type of uh, argumentation and doctrine that he teaches in his known epistles. But whoever the author is, is basically trying to get the readers to trust God in trying times. And so it's particularly relevant, uh, really at any time, you could say, uh, but certainly for us today and in this uh, day and age where we're facing some pretty tough uh, situations. So last week, 
we kind of finished up kind of a, a, a two weeks discussion of the high priesthood of Christ. We're going to come back to that. The writer is throughout this uh, book again. But today we come uh, to a passage where it's a short passage, just three verses, where he talks about five marks of spiritual immaturity. Now, a lot of pastors and Bible teachers are quick to point out the marks of spiritual maturity, but I want to point out some of these marks of spiritual immaturity. When an adult acts like a child, immaturity is pretty noticeable. Uh, But what about spiritually? Can we notice spiritual immaturity? Can we recognize it in our own lives and in possibly the lives of others? So let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in uh, verse uh, 12. So the first thing I want you to notice is that spiritual maturity is marked by a lack of interest in doctrinal matters. A lack of interest in doctrinal matters. And for this first one, we actually have to go back to pick up the context of the last verse we looked at last week, verse 11 here in uh, chapter 5, where the author points out that the readers had become dull of hearing. Remember he said, of whom we have much to say, referring to Melchizedek, the the high priest in Abraham's day, and we're going to come back to him in chapter 7 of Hebrews and learn a little bit more about Melchizedek. But uh, the writer of Hebrews here says that his original audience really wasn't in a place where they would even be able to understand if he tried to explain to them Melchizedek. He's going to attempt to do so a little bit later, but he's basically saying they have become dull of hearing. Dull of hearing. One of the earliest symptoms of spiritual immaturity is a dullness toward the Bible. A dullness toward the Bible. Bible study class is dull. Preaching is dull. Anything spiritual is dull. Reading biblical or theological studies is dull. These are the Christians who who might be very active at every social event or party, and even sometimes great workers in the church. But when it comes time for studying God's Word or real serious doctrinal discussions, often they're nowhere to be found. And dull of hearing implies that, that, that they don't listen to the Word of God despite hearing it over and over again. It's not that they're not hearing it. They're just not listening to it, if you know what I mean. Their, their sense of hearing has become dull. Notice it says, he says they become dull of hearing. That means that there was a time when they welcomed doctrinal teaching. They were hungry for it. But over time, they've kind of lost interest. And that was the case with these Christians. As I said, some of these probably came to faith in Christ 30 years earlier. In the great day of Pentecost, when Peter preached his sermon and the church was founded. And now they had kind of dispersed abroad because of some of the persecutions there, starting with the martyrdom of Stephen. But, uh, and many of them may have come to faith later on as the church spread. But certainly, for a lot of them, we get the sense from the writer, these were older Christians. That, that is, they'd been Christians for a long time. And perhaps early on, man, they, they just couldn't get enough teaching. They wanted to know all about this Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who had fulfilled all of the prophecies with which they were very familiar from studying the Old Testament. And they had become convinced, as Peter said in his, his Pentecost sermon, that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the one. And they, they believed in Him. They became born again. And they just probably were eager and excited to learn more about Him and to learn what the apostles uh, had to say. And yet, here they are. Their faith is tested. Life is getting difficult. And somehow along the way, they had become complacent in their study of doctrinal matters. And so they were in danger of sort of giving up. Giving up. Again, as we've said many times, this has nothing to do with their position in Christ. It's not about whether they would go to heaven or hell. Many a Christian has sadly become sidetracked on the, uh, the sidelines of life and uh, shipwrecked on the sidelines of life and, and not you know, kind of given attention to the spiritual life within them. And it doesn't mean they go to hell for that. It just means they miss out on the blessings of knowing Lord, the, the, the abundant life that comes with knowing Christ and rewards even coming in the future in, in the kingdom and things like that. So he didn't want his readers to have that experience. He didn't want them to cast away their confidence and give up on the blessings that come with staying in close fellowship with the Lord Jesus. So what about you? Are you eager and excited about studying God's Word today? Are you as eager and excited as you have been at other times in your life? 
Well, if not, that's a possible indication that you become dull of hearing. Paul put it this way when he wrote his second letter to Timothy. He said, the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. And yet doctrine is at the heart of spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. So ask yourself, are you bored by doctrinal matters? So, first of all, a lack of interest in doctrinal matters. But spiritual maturity is also indicated by an inability to learn the Scriptures on your own. Uh, You know, one of the things that people forget is that although in God's divine design during this present age, He uses and appoints uh, pastors and teachers, the Bible calls them elders, uh, to dig deeper into the Word of God, make it their life's calling, and be able to use that to motivate and encourage and exhort the body, Every believer, not just pastors, is called and capable of studying the Word of God. I mean, I may be working myself out of a job here, but you know, you don't have to go to seminary to be able to understand the truths of God's Word. There is a fundamental doctrine called the perspicuity of the Scriptures that, that, that was given that label going all the way back to the Reformation days when people for the first time in centuries could start reading their Bible for themselves without being burned at the stake. <laughs> Uh, in Roman Catholic dominance. So they started reading the Bibles for themselves, and and the the church uh, established this doctrine called the perspicuity of the Scriptures, which simply says that the Scriptures are understandable by any layperson. I've always thought it was a rather ironic name for a doctrine, perspicuity, because you can barely say it, much less uh, define it. But what it means is understandability. You may not understand what perspicuity means, but you can understand the Bible. And so... Uh, spiritually mature people love to study the Word on their own rather than being spoon-fed by some book or doctrine or uh, curriculum and things like that. You know, as, as children grow up, they, they learn to feed themselves. Little Zoe is, is uh, learning to feed herself now. He has one of those little plastic children's forks, you know, and she'll you know, eat it, and, and uh, you know, by the time she's done, it's all over her face and all over her bib and everything. She's learning. But now, if an adult, if you or I were trying to eat and we couldn't keep the food on the fork, we couldn't find our mouth, food was all over our face and all over our shirt, people would say, something's wrong there. And by the way, I might mention to my kids that are here or that might be watching this video later, There's going to come a day when that's going to be true of me, but it doesn't mean I'm crazy. It just means I'm old, okay? So that doesn't apply. But a normal, healthy adult can feed himself or can feed herself, right? And I hope that the messages that I preach and the Bible studies that I lead here at Plum Creek Chapel motivate you to dig deeper into the Word of God. Notice what he says here in verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you. See, these believers were more comfortable being taught than teaching. The problem is the only spiritual lessons that they were interested in learning are the same ones that they learned back in first grade Sunday school, you might say. And even those lessons are kind of hard for them to learn. See, spiritually mature Christians are those who sit in a classroom or sanctuary for one or two hours a week and feel like they've studied all the Bible all they need to. But the reality is we're all commanded to get into the Word of God personally. Personally. Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the, 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 the first principles of the oracles of God. That phrase, first principles there, refers to the, the ABCs. That's why I called this, do you know your ABCs? It's the foundational truths. Paul put it this way, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. The old King James translated this verse, study. Study, as in study the Word of God. Why? So that you'll be approved to God. Uh, That is, you'll pass the test. You'll be pleasing to Him. You won't need to be ashamed. You've you've rightly divided the Word of God. This, This phrase, rightly divided, many of you may be familiar with this uh, passage, it, it means to cut straight. The, the NIV translates it to correctly handle the Word of God. But the idea here is that you study the Word of God, handling it correctly, you know, studying it correctly. The, the literal Greek word here, it's the only time it's ever used in the New Testament, and it means to cut straight. It's this word orthotomeo. 
I may have talked about this in passing before, but it's, it's where we get the English word orthodontia or orthodontist, right? It's a surgical word. I mean, uh, any orthodontist uh, worth his salt is going to make your teeth straight, right? You would not want to pay an orthodontist to make your teeth crooked. And that's what this Greek word means, to cut straight, to cut the word of God straight, to rightly divide. Paul uses uh, this word here to describe how we're to handle God's word. We are to let the word of God, the words on the page, the nouns, the subjects, the verbs, cut a straight path to the meaning. We're not to be sidetracked by speculations and spiritualized meaning and, and sort of symbol, symbolic meaning where we're trying to discern something between the lines. Just let the words mean and say what they say. It's the way communication works, by the way. You don't sit there and try to decode, I hope, what I'm saying. Hopefully I'm using words that you know, you understand the subject, the noun, the verbs. I'm not speaking gibberish, or nor am I speaking another language that you don't know. That's the way communication works, and that's what he says we are to do with the Word of God. Study it and cut straight. It's the only time it's used in the New Testament, but it is used a couple of times in the Old Testament. Remember, the Old Testament that was written in Hebrew and Aramaic was eventually translated into Greek about 300 years before Christ, uh, because that was the common language of the Roman Empire and so and the Greek Empire. And so uh, in the Old Testament, we see two occasions where orthotomeo is used to translate a Hebrew word. One of them is in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Some English translations say, He shall make your paths straight. So they chose to translate this with, Orthotomeo, to cut straight. Or Proverbs 11.5. The righteousness of the blameless will direct his way, will cut a straight path for him. The idea is that following God's will and God's direction and God's instruction in your life will cut a straight path in an unhindered uh, direction across a country, avoiding potholes and other things, and make it easier for you to go through life, unhindered, if you stick with God's word. So if we go back to 2 Timothy 2.15, spiritually immature believers have an inability to learn the scriptures on their own, to cut straight. They, they much prefer soundbite theology and bumper sticker uh, theology. And yet, one of the hallmarks of wisdom, according to Proverbs, is to apply your heart to instruction. Did you know one in three Americans owns five or more Bibles? And yet there's an abundance of biblical illiteracy. There's a direct relationship between how much time you spend in the Word of God and your level of spiritual maturity. Remember we talked about in recent weeks how obedience comes from trusting God and trusting God comes from knowing God. Remember the know, trust, obey model? You've got to know God before you're going to trust Him. And you've got to trust Him before you're going to obey Him. So if you're struggling to cut that straight path in life and to, to live for Christ and to be obedient and to produce fruit of the Spirit, it all goes back to how much you know about God. The more you know Him, the more you'll love Him. He's our Creator. He, he wants us to know all about Him. So can you pick up a Bible? and read it and, and understand. See, the devil does a great job of convincing people that the Bible is confusing and that we can't understand it. It's not. If you can speak the language, you can understand it. Um, so lack of interest in doctrinal matters and inability to learn the Scriptures on your own. And then notice this, regression in biblical knowledge. Just as his readers had become disinterested in doctrine, as we saw earlier, they become less knowledgeable, it follows, about uh, the Bible. I, I taught full-time at a college and seminary for 12 years, and one of the things at the college level that we would do is every student that was admitted to the college, it was a Bible college, so that meant you had to double major in Bible and something else. That's the definition of a Bible college, as opposed to, say, a Christian liberal arts school where you might take one or two Bible classes, but that's it. In a Bible college, you're going to take 20 credit hours of Bible. And so we were a Bible college, and part of our assessment would be as students would get admitted to the college, they would be given what's called a Bible content test, a BCT. And in our particular school, we had about 2,000 students. The average score, and I was director of baccalaureate program, so I was very involved in this, was typically around 30% on these 
test of incoming students. I mean, and it was basic stuff. It's like, you know, who took the animals on the ark and how many gospels were there and how many disciples did Jesus have? And I mean, really basic Bible content, not deep theological stuff, but just information from the Bible. They'd get about 30%. After their two-year associate's degree or their two-year degree completion program, we would give the BCT test again to see how we're doing as educators. And the average test of outgoing students was typically 70 to 80 percent. So they had learned uh, the Word of God. They had learned more about the Bible. So I wonder how you would do on a BCT test. Notice what the author says here in verse 12. Again, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone again to teach you the first principles of the oracles of God. Again, it's this ABCs, the elementary truths of Christianity. In fact, the NIV translates it here, quote, By this time you ought to be teachers, yet you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. That's a paraphrase, but that's a good sense of what he's talking about here when we talk about the first principles of the oracles of God. These readers were, were still trying to master the basic truths of Scripture. You know, he, he's really being kind of humorous here. He's saying, you should be teaching others the integral rules of grammar and the English language, and instead you're still learning your ABCs. That's, that's the idea here. He goes on to say, you have come to need milk and not solid food. Notice again, come to need. These believers had passed first grade, but now they're being sent back. Why? Because of neglect. Um, as a new believer grows over time, he should grow in, in the kind of spiritual food that he requires, right? You know, new Christians, like newborn babies, require milk, spiritual milk, basic stuff. And, and he's going to go on to say, we'll look at this next week, things about baptism and about church attendance and about prayer and witnessing and fellowship, just basic stuff. You're now part of the family of God. You've been born from above. You're Born again believer, John 1.12 says you become a child of God in essence, part of the family of God. So here's, here's the way we do things in the family, right? You should pray and talk to God. You should share your faith with others. You should come to church and fellowship and be you know, fed and grow. But as time goes by, you should graduate up to solid foods. Um, you know, just like babies, right? Zoe, I remember the first time we fed her chicken. Little, was it a baby food or just a piece of... Oh, it would have been baby food because, yeah, she was first time trying baby food. Oh, the look on her face was hilarious. We tried to capture it on video, but she was not sure what to make of that chicken. It was quite, quite funny. The um, same thing is true for these Hebrew Christians. They were quite happy drinking milk, but that was all they were getting. And so their wavering state of mind at this moment in the late 60s as it related to whether they should continue steadfastly to trust God no matter what the government and, and society was telling them, was aided and abetted by the fact that they were not mature. Uh, they, 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 the allurement to abandon their faith would have been less enticing if they'd have been on solid food. Peter put it this way, as newborn babes, new Christians, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. But we don't stay on milk. We desire more solid food. And then he goes on to say that unrighteous behavior is inevitably a mark of spiritual maturity. Lack of knowledge ultimately leads to lack of godly behavior, as I said a moment ago. Notice what he says in verse 13. Everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Word of righteousness is literally the teaching about righteous behavior. That's the idea there. Immature believers have not yet learned how to put what little teaching they are taking in to effective use. And so it shows. It shows in their moral choices. It shows in their behavior. Um, Paul put it this way in 2 Timothy uh, chapter uh, 3. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof for correction, but also for instruction in righteousness. See, the, the knowledge of God's Word helps us understand what to do and what not to do, how to behave and how not to behave. Right? So it goes without saying that a, a common mark of maturity is, you know, 
righteous behavior. And a common mark of immaturity is unrighteous behavior. But I want to point out that's not the only mark. And by the way, not all unrighteous behavior on the part of a believer is an indication of some inherent spiritual maturity. We all do things at times that are disobedient. It's called walking in the flesh. So even a mature believer is not perfect. And even a mature believer might have moments of weakness now and then. But their lives are not characterized by unrighteous behavior. Uh, you know, even, you know, I, I remember one time having a discussion with some people. This was years ago when I was in college. And, of course, when you're in college, you know everything. And, and I was in college and thought I knew everything. And so I was having an argument with some older adults. They were older to me at the time. I was probably 19. They were like 25. I thought that was old, you know. And uh, so we were having this argument about something. I don't even remember the nature of the argument. But uh, I remember the one lady, I, I got kind of heated and and, 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 and just animated, and she, she kind of stepped back. She, she and her husband were there, and she stepped back, and she said, well, somebody's obviously in the flesh. And so I said, well, uh, sorry to hear that. If you want to take a moment and collect yourself, you can. I'll, I'm going to be waiting right here. But she was talking about me, and she was right. And it doesn't necessarily mean I was immature, although I was acting immature, but I didn't have an inherent immaturity about me. I was just in the flesh in that moment. And if all you ever eat is spiritual milk, you'll not learn how to behave righteously in certain areas of your life. Only as the depth of our study of God's Word increases can the depth of our righteousness and righteous manifested behavior begin to increase. So does your behavior reflect spiritual maturity? And then lastly, another mark of spiritual maturity is, a, is little or no spiritual discernment. One of the biggest problems in the church today is a lack of spiritual discernment. And these all flow naturally one from the other. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago in our 9 o'clock series on Spirit of the Antichrist, how to overcome deception. You know, brethren, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're of God, right? And spiritually immature believers are more likely to be led astray, to gobble up everything they hear. You know, if you notice, children, young children, will put anything in their mouth, right? You, when they start toddling and crawling, you put them down, you better clear the area. Because I don't care whether it's an sh- old dirty sock, a shoe, a remote control for the tea. It does, if they can grasp it, it's going in their mouth, right? I remember my oldest son, Morgan, um, when he was, I don't even remember how old, but I took him and his older sisters to the mall for, to, to go to the pet store. And they were, the older girls liked to get in and play with the pets, you know. And So I was just sitting there with Morgan, who was in the stroller, letting them play for a, a bit and not, kind of not paying attention to Morgan. He was strapped in the stroller, after all. And uh, the girls were playing with the pets. And all of a sudden, I looked down at Morgan, and he had reached up to the shelf uh, that we were parked right beside in the pet store, grabbed a bottle of pet shampoo, unscrewed it, and was drinking it. And I rushed, rushed him up to the front counter, and I said, and it said on the back, call, call poison control, poison control if it's ingested. Call poison control, we called him, and they read the ingredients and said, that's not a problem. And he did, you could tell he hadn't gotten much in there. But, you know, that's what kids do. You know, if they can reach it, it's going in their mouth. And that's what a lot of spiritually immature Christians do. If, if you can hear it, you're going to gobble it up. No ability to discern, is this false doctrine? Is this true to Scripture? What does the Bible say? And listen to what uh, the writer says here. Solid food belongs to those who are full age, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. I heard someone say one time that the church at large in the world today in these last days is basically one giant nursery. <laughs> you know, a bunch of spiritual babies who just buy anything you want. You know, if it's on sale at the bookstore, they don't even have Christian bookstores anymore. They have Christian knickknack stores. But, uh, you know, you, you know, you buy a book because it's on sale or you get a free hat with it or something. Um, people don't take the time to look at the back of the book. You know, on the back of books, they usually tell you a little bit about the author and they, where they went to school, what their doctrinal framework is. They also usually have some blurbs. And if you pick up a book and it's recommended, you know, by Benny Hinn and people like that, probably an indication that it's not sound. But if it's recommended by people that are sound, have a good biblical conservative view of God's Word as the inspired and fallible Word of God, okay, maybe it's worth uh, using. But we have to have discernment. Not all that glitters is gold. 
Um, again, um, Paul put it this way, For the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine, because having itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Notice this, they will turn their ears away from truth and be turned aside to fables. And one of the marks of spiritual immaturity is an inability to discern. Some of the wisest men and women I've known, humanly speaking, are those who are not spiritually discerning. It's amazing uh, to me. You know, um, you, you know, it reminds me of what Ravi Zacharias uh, uh, said, uh, in, in the late Ravi, Ravi Zacharias. I think he had a podcast called Let My People Think. <laughs> you know, sometimes I just want to say to people, think. Just, I mean, you're an engineer, you're a quantum physicist, you brilliant mind, but you, yet you're not able to discern spiritual wisdom and truth um, because we're not in the Word of God. Uh, in Ephesians, Paul said, we should not be children who are tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Why? Because babies, children will put anything in their mouth. They'll gobble up anything. The symptoms of immature spiritual groupthink are, oh, this guy's a great speaker. This guy's got you know great illustrations, but what's the truth of what's being said? Um, later on, the writer of Hebrews, one of the many reasons a lot of people think it was Paul, is going to use a similar analogy when he says in chapter 13, don't be carried about with various and strange doctrines. And I think this is one of the most dangerous problems associated with spiritual immaturity. Uh, is that it has an impact on that person and those around them and others whom they influence because they don't have spiritual discernment. Is your doctrinal grounding solid enough to recognize false doctrine? That's the question. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, five marks of spiritual immaturity. A lack of interest in doctrinal matters, an inability to study and learn the scriptures on your own, regression in your biblical knowledge, inevitably manifest in unrighteous behavior of sorts, and no spiritual discernment. As you look at this list, how do you stack up? You know, I really wish, I've thought about this often, I wish that there was sort of a, a David Copperfield Christianity where you, get, you trust Christ, believe the gospel, and poof, instantly you're changed into a mature, godly believer who never makes a mistake, never gets sucked into false teaching, never you know, misbehaves. But it doesn't happen that way. It takes time. It takes saturating yourself with the Word of God. I saw a sign in a, in a plant nursery one time that said, the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. The next best time is today. Today is the best time to start growing in your faith. Um, I mean, 10 years of consistent, ideal spiritual growth would be wonderful. But if you don't have that, fine. Start today. Get in the Word of God. So ask yourself, would you pass the marshmallow test? Do you have the spiritual maturity to exercise patience, to choose the better of two options, to make wise choices, to delay gratification in exchange for a greater reward? At its core, that's what the writer was getting at and has been getting at through his whole letter. They could, they could forsake the assembling of themselves together. They could disassociate with Christianity or the way. They could kind of hide in with a crowd of Jews that were unbelievers, that were still uh, uh, under the protection of, of Rome. But the consequence for that would be great. Loss of reward. Or they could stand firm, be mature, be willing to take a stand in the face of difficulty. And there was a great reward awaiting them, both in the fullness of life as well as in the kingdom someday. So here's the takeaway. Two questions just to consider this week. Number one, are you progressing in your knowledge of God? You know, I've, I've often said that theology, and, and that's what my passion is, my degree is in systematic theology, is a lifelong process, not a product. You don't write a theology book, an eight-volume set, and say, okay, I'm done. I figured it all out. Theology is a process, not a product. You study it your whole life, and even by the time we die, we're not going to understand it all. We're going to wait till we get to heaven when we have perfect knowledge. So you ought to be progressing. Are you progressing in your knowledge of God? And more importantly, are you putting into practice what you learn? 
Because remember, the goal of Bible study is not just to get smarter, it's to change your life. That's the goal of Bible study. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, just this uh, message from your word today about spiritual maturity. Lord, and the convicting nature of the fact that are we really ready to face what may be coming down the pike? We've been so blessed as American Christians and uh, not had to face what many of our brothers and sisters throughout the world have faced and are facing even now in terms of persecution. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen our faith. Give us a renewed passion for your word. Help us to dive into it and learn and grow from it. Lord, if there's one here today that is not a believer, I just pray that Uh, the Spirit of God would convict them of their need for a Savior, that they're a sinner who needs a Savior, and that only Jesus Christ can forgive sin and, uh, and give eternal life because He paid our penalty and died on the cross. And it's in His precious name that we pray. Amen.